Man, it's good to be here. I don't know about you guys, but this week's been busy, a lot going on. I know getting ready for school. Some of you have already started school and whatnot. Pretty crazy. But man, it's good to be together, right? I love it. I love getting together with people that love Jesus, right? It's awesome. And I was feeling really good until Pastor Pat mentioned this word audit, you know, and I was kind of like freaking out a little bit, having an anxiety attack, but no, just kidding. Love it. Uh, (laughs) um, Yeah, welcome. Uh, I want to welcome everybody that's online watching, those in Claremont, Super excited uh, for our message today. My name is Paul, and I'll be sharing something that's been um, on my heart for a while, but uh, just feeling like it's what the Lord would have for us. So if you guys don't mind, I want to just pray real quick again, and then we're going to jump into the message. So Lord, we're thankful, so thankful that we can be together, so thankful that we have each other, so thankful that we have your word, so thankful that we have your spirit dwelling in us, and we're so thankful that you want to speak to us and you want to work in our lives, and that's what we're asking for right now this evening. We pray in the name of Jesus, amen. So I know that bold has been kind of the uh, word and the kind of thought and the direction you guys have been focusing on throughout the year, and I wanted to talk today about boldly bearing God's image. Um, I've really been loving the series in Genesis. Any guys been here for that? Really enjoying that? Isn't that awesome? I've really I've been learning a lot, uh, and I love the beginnings, the origins, um, and uh, I've been I've been thinking a lot about that. You know, picture of us being God's image bearers. Uh, and we're going to get into that. But it's been cool kind of looking at all the mystery, right? All the wonder of creation. And uh, sometimes, you know, I don't know if this is a right or wrong, but I, I kind of like to imagine things sometimes because not everything is like spelled out, but it's kind of cool, right? To just wonder and to, to look at, you know, what God has done and just be amazed. Sometimes I wonder if that's kind of what we're supposed to do sometimes, right? Is just be amazed at God. Uh, so that's been super cool. Um, but, you know, and I think, you know, I know we're going to take a little break maybe from Genesis, but we're going to be getting into some of what happened after, right, God created. And uh, I've been thinking a little bit about, you know, creation, all the wonder, all of the amazement. But then I look around, and honestly, I'll, I'll have to be honest with you, is I kind of wonder what happened, right? I mean, if you kind of remember with me the beginnings we know that everything was made, it was made complete, right? There was no, like, lack. There wasn't anything wrong with creation. You know, there wasn't any suffering. There wasn't any evil. But then, uh, when I look around in my world, I don't know about your world, but I'll, I'll be honest. I, I see pain, right? I see brokenness. I see suffering. I see things that aren't complete, things that just feel wrong. And um, I just wonder... What happened? <laughs> what happened? Uh, you know, do we think, man, that was just like a fairy tale, Genesis, the first few chapters there, or some, you know, uh, folklore that's been passed down through the ages. But I think that it's important that we understand what's happened and why we're in the position in the place that we're in right now. We know that, you know, just quickly, we know that, you know, us, humanity, kind of rejected God's way. We chose, our, we chose our own way, and we brought all the brokenness and the suffering and the evil into the world that we're in, right, uh, today. Um, and if you think about something that, you know, I've struggled with over the years and a lot of people ask questions about is, you know, why is there suffering? Why is there pain? Why do people get sick? Sometimes we don't think about it. How many of you have had like a cold or a, the flu? Anybody here? Everybody, right? I mean, when you have a cold, do you kind of sit down and just like ponder like, why is there suffering in the world? I don't think so. It's just kind of like, oh, I got to take some, uh, what do we take around here? Strepsils? Do you have strepsils here? Or is that like an overseas? NyQuil or, you know, you pop some cough syrup or, or whatnot and you just get through it, right? You don't really think about it. But... Then you, you know, come face to face with maybe some kind of like terminal illness, right, or a prolonged sickness, 
or maybe you know you see those that struggle with disabilities or people with special needs, right? And it's it's kind of like a different thing. And I'll what I think is like that something's not right about this. Something's wrong. And I want to talk with you about how you and I can boldly bear God's image even in the midst of pain, suffering, and brokenness. And what I'd like to do, if you'll allow me, is I just want to read a story from the life of Jesus that I think really gives us a great picture of the pain and suffering that's in the world, but how we can boldly bear God's image in the midst of that. And that story is in John chapter 9. So if you have your Bible, that's great. If you have your device, open it up, or we'll have it on the screen. We're going to read in John chapter 9, and we're going to just go ahead and read the whole kind of first part of this story from verses 1 through 7. John 9, 1 through 7. As Jesus was walking alone, along, sorry, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us. The night's coming, and then no one can work. But while I'm here in the world, I'm the light of the world. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. That's kind of disgusting, but, you know. He told the man... Go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means sent. So the man went, washed, and he came back seeing. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. I want to read those first couple verses again. It says, as Jesus was walking alone, he saw this man born blind. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? I want us to recognize the question that the disciples asked Jesus. They're wondering if this man's own sins or the sins of his parents are the reason for this man's blindness. And I think that the disciples are kind of onto something, you know, not completely, but what they're doing is they're connecting the, mind, the, the blindness of this man with sin, with sin, right? And we know, right? We know, like, talked about. We're going to unpack it probably in the next uh, months or so that, that sin is the result of rejecting God's way, choosing our own way, and it leads to sickness, suffering, illness, brokenness. So the disciples are kind of on the right track here. They're kind of on the right track. You know, in, in their day, in the disciples' day, it was, it was very common in their society to think that way, to assume that if someone was sick, that it was a result of of some sin, right? Maybe it was their own sin, or maybe it was a sin of like some ancestor or the parents. And that their suffering, okay, the sickness, it was a result of God's judgment on that sin. That was kind of the way that their thinking went in that time. So like I said, I think the disciples are trying to figure out what is going on here? But notice, notice in verse 3. I love how Jesus answers them. He says, It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. Some you know, translations say that this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So Jesus' short answer, it kind of shatters all the, you know, preconceived ideas that the disciples had about this blind man, this man born blind. And I can imagine, I can imagine that the disciples might have been a little bit like shocked or perplexed or surprised at Jesus' answer. They thought they knew why this man was born blind, right? Like they didn't give any room for any other reason. They said either it's his sins or it's the, the parents' sins. But Jesus, he doesn't, he says, no, it's not either. It's not either. Man, how often can you and I be just like the disciples, right? We think we know the reason for things. And often we don't. I think often we try to find the reason for suffering or sin. And sometimes 
we miss what God's trying to do. So what I want to suggest to you tonight and what I want you to consider, what I, the question I have for you is, have you ever considered that how we respond to the consequences of sin in this world might not be the way that God wants us to respond, right? So when we see sin or we see the consequences of sin, the brokenness, the suffering, the pain, when we see those who struggle with terminal illnesses, disabilities, maybe we're not responding the way that God would want us to respond. I don't think the disciples responded the way that God wanted. So often we respond according to like maybe traditions or our culture, maybe the way that we feel at the time. Uh, you know, sometimes we respond to our religious background, maybe the things that we've been told depending on, you know, what kind of circles we grew up in. Sometimes we even respond to brokenness according to a certain kind of like political agenda and leaning, believe it or not. But I want to encourage you, I want to challenge you that maybe we can invite Jesus to change the way that we think we should respond to these kinds of things. And let's give Jesus some room to do that in our lives, okay? To change the way that we respond to the brokenness that is all around us and that's in the world. You know, this answer that Jesus gave to the disciples is so interesting for me because it's not really an answer. He doesn't, he doesn't really say the reason, right? He didn't say. He just said, no, this, is, this happened so that actually God, something about God could be known, so that God could be revealed in this situation. He didn't even tie it to a specific kind of consequence. So how can we, you and I, as followers of Jesus, boldly bear God's image in a broken and hurting world. How can we do that? And that's kind of the meat of what I want to talk with you about right now. If you're a vegan, I'm sorry I use the word meat, but, uh, you know, <laughs> tofu, all right? The tofu of what we want to talk about. The first thing, we boldly bear God's image as we are people who hope in God's healing, as we're people who hope in God's healing in the midst of brokenness, hurt, pain, suffering, sickness. You know, I think this is probably the most obvious conclusion that we can get from this story, right? Jesus healed the man. This man had been born blind. He had lived his whole life. We know that he was a grown man, but at whatever age as a grown man he was, we know that Jesus healed him. Jesus healed him. And you know what? Jesus heals today. I'm not anybody special, but I've had the honor of praying for people that were sick and God healed them instantly. It's amazing. My wife, I've seen it. We had a, a good friend of ours who prayed for her. She had a serious problem with her back and she was healed. God heals. And I'm sure some of you have your own stories. And God heals. But sometimes... God doesn't heal. I'm not anybody special, and I've prayed for people, and they haven't been healed. <laughs> I don't know, right? I don't know why. I don't have the answers. And sometimes this messes up certain people's theology about how God heals and why God heals, but sometimes we just don't know why God doesn't heal maybe when we want him to. But I want to suggest to you that God does heal. He does heal. And this is one of the hopes that we should believe in, that we should declare, proclaim, is that every sickness, every healing, all suffering will one day be done away with. When God's kingdom comes, there won't be any suffering. And that's our hope. Do you understand? So maybe I'm suffering I have some illness and I've prayed and I've fasted and I've done everything that anybody has told me to do, but God hasn't healed me. Guess what? I know that God's going to heal me one day. It's coming. It will happen. We, as Jesus followers, know that God is a God that heals. And I think that's what we see, by the way, with Jesus. 
when he came. So often when he was on the earth, you know, in his physical body and he was healing or when he would send his disciples out, he would use this interesting phrase when they were healing people and when they were casting out demons. He would say, tell people that the kingdom of God has come near. Jesus was kind of like a precursor when he was on the earth in his human body of the kingdom of God, what it's going to be like. When the kingdom of God is on the earth, there's not going to be any demons inhabiting people, doing crazy things with them. There's not going to be anybody that struggles with sickness. It's going to be done away with. And that's what we see with Jesus when he was here, right, on this earth. And we continue that as his people, you know, and we proclaim and we believe in his healing, whether it happens now or later, okay? So that's one way that we boldly bear God's image in this broken world is we are a people that have hope in God's healing. Oh, it's, I love that. I love that. Another way we boldly bear God's image is how we respond to suffering and sickness as God does. When we respond to suffering and sickness the way that God does, we're showing people who God is. We're showing people who God is. You know, God doesn't distance himself from our suffering, from our brokenness. He doesn't ignore it, and he's not indifferent toward it. If you're listening, if you're here, if you have a loved one, if you're someone who is a caregiver for someone who has some difficult sickness, disability, special needs, I want you to know that God is near to you that he's near, he's not far away, he hasn't forgotten about you. God enters into that with us and he wants us to do the same. Listen to a couple verses from the Old Testament, right? Some people think that the Old Testament shows a God who's angry and just kills everybody and he's kind of crazy. But here's a couple verses from the Old Testament about how God thinks about those who have disabilities or who suffer, the oppressed, the disadvantaged. In Leviticus uh, chapter 19, verse 14, it says, God says this, do not insult the deaf or cause the blind to stumble. You must fear your God, I am the Lord. That's God. Don't mess with those who have disabilities. God is near, he knows, he sees. In Psalm 82, Verses three and four, it says, give justice to the poor and the orphan. Uphold the rights of the oppressed and the destitute. Rescue the poor and the helpless. Deliver them from the grasp of evil people. We, God's people, followers of Jesus, we show the world who God is when we respond in these ways, in the ways that God responds to it. You know, I've been a cross-cultural worker for more than 20 years, and one of the, there's a few different things that I'm kind of like proud of about that and some things that I'm ashamed of when we talk about that. When I say cross-cultural wor- uh, mis- or worker, kind of an older, more traditional term is the term missionary, okay? Uh, and if you are wondering why I don't like to use the term missionary, you can ask me after. I'll tell you why. But one of the things that we haven't done well in the world of missions over the decades and centuries is that um, we've brought too much of our culture when we've gone cross-culture to try and reach certain peoples, you know, and you've heard of the terms like imperialism, right, and colonialism, and unfortunately, missionaries have been guilty of that at times. But one of the things that I'm super proud of in that heritage is that Almost all over the world, in most cultures and most civilizations, it, were, it was Jesus' followers that brought healing and a recognition that people who have disabilities or special needs or suffer sicknesses, that they, we should treat them with dignity and that we should try to help them. You know, many cultures, if you read and study what did they do with the elderly and the sick and the, dis- the, the disabled? They discarded them. It seems kind of crazy in our day and age, but it, it actually happens still to this day. They just discarded them. 
They didn't know what to do with them. They just thought they're a drain on society. They're a drain on resources. So we're just going to discard them and we're going to, I don't know, pretend like they don't exist. My good friend, I went to college with him. He's, uh, he's Ethiopian. And he went back many years ago after we finished college and he started a home in his home country for uh, um, kids who've been infected with AIDS from their parents. Because in that culture, they just take those kids and they just leave them. They take them outside the village and they leave them and they leave them to, to die. That's what they do. And so he goes and he rescues these kids and he takes them and he has a house and he has all kinds of caregivers there. They call them moms, all these women, and they, they raise these kids like their own, right? I'm proud of that. You should be proud of that. And that's what we should be about as Jesus followers, because that's what God does. That's how God responds. We should be in the brokenness. We should be in the pain. We should be in the suffering because God is. That's how we re he responds. Um, you know, and I think that a, a, a big key to this, being in the brokenness, in the suffering, responding as God does, is, is learning how to be people who empathize with pain, those who struggle, who are suffering. And it's actually super important. We often don't respond as God does because we have never learned or we've never been willing to empathize with people. You guys know what empathy is? Empathy, it's the ability, I didn't know what this was before, so I had to, you know, learn, but Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feeling of another. That's empathy. It's different than sympathy. I used to get those two mixed up. Sympathy is when you feel, you know, sorry for or you feel compassion for someone else's, you know, difficulty or misfortune. But empathy is actually when you take the time and the effort to put yourself in the place of that other person. Man, I wish Jesus' followers would do this more often. Before we give our opinion, before we judge, before we tell people what they should do in their situation, put yourself in that person's situation and learn to feel what they feel in that situation. Why is this important? Why is this important? Because that's what God did. Jesus is the ultimate empathizer. You know, just think about this. I want us to just think about this man that was born blind for a second. And if you can, you know, if you want to close your eyes, do that. If you're weird about closing your eyes, don't. But to, like, go back into the time of this man who was born blind, okay? Let's just try to practice a little empathy if we can. Knowing how people thought about people who were disabled, who struggled with sickness, right? Imagine the, the rumors that went around about these, the parents of this guy. Oh, they probably did something really bad. Maybe some secret sin. That's why God has judged them, you know? Maybe the rumors that were going around about this man himself. You know, in that day and age, the Jews actually believed that in the womb you could sin, and sometimes as a result of that sin that you would be born with some kind of uh, sickness. Can you imagine the, the hurt, right? The emotional toll that this lifelong sickness had taken on this man and his parents? I don't know if any of you maybe have a, yourself are struggling with this or a family member who's been sick their whole life. It's It's exhausting. It is, it's overwhelming at times. I wonder if the parents ever struggled with guilt. You ever wonder that? Maybe they blamed themselves for their son being born blind. Who here is without sin? Nobody. Maybe they thought, oh, that sin that I committed, maybe my son was born blind because of that, or maybe because of this. The guilt. Maybe the man blamed himself. Maybe people had fed him that lie that, oh, you're blind because of this, this, and this. I don't know. 
No doubt this man was excluded from being accepted in any kind of social gathering. You know, this was a, a shameful thing that he was born blind. He wouldn't have been welcome, you know, to any kind of community events, maybe not even welcome to family gatherings. I don't know. This man, how did he survive? He begged, right? He begged for his living. We know that from the rest of the story, that he would sit on the roadside and he would beg. I don't think anybody in this room, maybe, but I doubt that anybody in this room has ever had to beg so that they could survive. I've never had to do that. I've known people who have, and it's humiliating. It's humiliating. So often we look at people like that and what do we do? We try to find the reasons of why they got in that situation, right? Empathy, empathize. Are we willing to take the time? Are we willing to take the time and the effort to learn, to put ourselves in the place of someone else? You know, in our Western society, sickness, blindness, disability, special needs, it's not really shameful, right? Uh, I would say that in the last 50 years, maybe a little bit more, that Western society has done a lot. They've gone, like, progressed a lot in, the, in their awareness of, of disabilities and sickness and the, the need to, you know, be, include those who, who suffer. You know, churches, you know, churches, unfortunately, have been behind a little bit, but I would say in the last couple decades, you know, we've done a lot better. We've recognized that some people, they have special needs, right? And they have disabilities and maybe they can't just come to church and maybe they need some kind of, you know, special, uh, you know, situation or your area, you know, that they can sit in so that they can come and be with us, you know? That's great. That's great. I still think that there's areas that we need to grow in as followers of Jesus, you know? Maybe there's not a stigma attached to, you know, being autistic, having autism, but maybe there's some stigma with those who suffer from mental illnesses, right? I think that this is a big issue in a, in a lot of, you know, churches, and I think we need to be really careful about that. Are we responding to those people the way that God responds to them? You know, like I said, you know, Jesus was the ultimate empathizer. Can you, I mean, this is, again, maybe we don't really think about it that much because we hear it so much, but God became a man. <laughs> the ultimate act of empathy. He literally came in our place. It's, it's crazy. He didn't have to do that. He didn't need to do that, but he did it so that we could know that he feels what we feel. He lived 30 years as a human. You can ask Pastor Chris why Jesus lived exactly, you know, a little over 30 years on the earth. He has the answer for that. I don't. No, but 30 years, why? He didn't have to. I mean, he could have come to die on the cross, raise again, and it could have probably been done a little bit quicker than that, maybe. I don't know. But do you see what I'm saying? He lived with us. He lived in our brokenness, in our pain, in our suffering. He experienced it for 30 years so that he could reach us. Are you willing to do that, to show God to people? I mean, I don't, like that's crazy, the amount of time and the effort and his willingness to come and to be with us. He came into our brokenness. He wasn't separate. And that's why I know that God is not indifferent and he's not far away because he actually came into our brokenness in the person of Jesus Christ. So we boldly bear God's image, right, as we respond as God does. But we also boldly bear God's image as we walk through suffering, disabilities, and pain together, together. One of the things that I've been pretty baffled about this story and maybe I haven't completely figured out is when Jesus said this happened, you know, so that the power of God could be seen in this man, 
like I'm trying to figure out what the time frame is on that. I, I don't think that Jesus is teaching only that um, this man was born blind and his whole existence was only so that he could be healed by Jesus physically when he opened his eyes. And that's what displayed God. I don't think so. I think this man's whole life from the time he was born until whenever it is that he died was displaying God. You see what I'm saying? He was already displaying God even before he was healed from his blindness. And this is where I want to just pause for a second and I want us to think a little bit because it's so important. And I'm thinking about the context of us as followers of Jesus. Often when we think of people that have special needs, disabilities, or they suffer, we think about how we can what minister to them, right? How we can help them. And that's so true, right? We're responding as God did. That's what I, I just spoke about. But have you ever thought that maybe there, the presence of the, that, you know, the disability or the sickness or the brokenness is actually allowing us to learn something about God that we would not otherwise learn, that we wouldn't otherwise learn. Um, and the reason I'm sharing this is because I was kind of faced with this in our own lives. I don't really know when it happened, but, you know, at some point I recognized that this was true of myself and my family. So those of you who, who know us, you know, we have a son who has autism, right? And he also has epilepsy, and he has some mental delays, and, you know, he's been with us for 17 years. He, his actually, his birth mother lived with us before she gave birth to the child, and then we adopted him uh, when he was born, and he's been with us ever since. And he radically changed my life and our family's lives. And he taught us some things about God. He taught me things about God that I don't think I would have learned otherwise. You understand what I'm saying? Us being together, his presence with us is a gift. It's enriched our family so much. And that's what I want to say to us as the body as, of Jesus, as Jesus followers. Is anyone who is suffering a terminal illness or a prolonged sickness or has a disability of any kind, you're a gift to us, to the body, because you show us things about God that we wouldn't be able to learn otherwise. We need you. We need you with us. And we know God better because we're together. Um, you know, I've seen this in the, the lives of my kids. You know, my kids are my heroes. Uh, I see, you know, how, you know, the result of our son, Timothy, being with us, I've seen how it's taught them incredible amounts of love and compassion they know how to empathize better than some of, you know, most of the adults that I know. <laughs> um, and it's incredible. It's incredible. I've seen how he has impacted the churches that we've planted in different cultures. We've lived in many of those cultures where it's still considered a huge shame to have a child that has any kind of disability. Many of the cultures that we've lived in for the last 20 years, they hide Anybody who has a disability at home, they never leave the house because it's so shameful. It's so shameful. But God has used our sons to change those cultures. No joke. He has. And I, I pray that, you know, the presence of brokenness amongst us, it changes us so that we can better show God to the world. Um, so... Yeah, don't lose that. If you're suffering from crippling pain or maybe you're a caregiver, a family member, God wants to use that. 
It's a gift so that we can know God and reveal God more. Maybe the greatest challenges we face are the very things that allow us to more fully express God to the world. It's super important. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. You know, I want to read from 1 John chapter 4. It says that no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. So if you grow up in church, you know, maybe you've never thought about this, but I've thought about it. How do you see an invisible God? (laughs) Have you ever thought about that? Like the Bible talks so much about seeing God, and I'm like, he's invisible. Like how do you see an invisible God? Well, this verse tells us. He's brought to full expression where? Right here. As we gather, as we, throughout the week, within community, we love each other, we're actually seeing God. That's God with us. It's pretty powerful. And that is a powerful message for the world. I've seen some of the hardest people in the world come to Jesus because they've seen God manifested in the community of believers. I've seen the, some of the, the most fundamental Muslims, some of the hardest people, that's what broke them. That's what brought them to God, was seeing how God is manifest among us as we love each other in the midst of our brokenness. It's powerful, guys. Don't miss it. It's powerful. Um, so the last point I want to hit here and wrap it up with is that we also boldly show people God when we recognize our need for Jesus, our need for Jesus. Now, this is kind of crazy. Maybe you already have thought about it and read it, but for me, pretty impactful. At the end of the story about the man who was born blind in John chapter 9, this is what we read. Jesus said to the man who was born blind, I entered this world to render judgment to give sight to the blind and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Jesus tells us that this man's blindness was actually to show all of us that we're blind. (laughs) Jesus, man, is amazing. I love it. The ultimate brokenness of sin, the result of the fall, is what? is that we're blind and we don't even know it. That's the ultimate tragedy of the fall. Now check this out. Pain, suffering, blindness, it's here to show us that. It's here to show us that. This radically changed my approach to pain and suffering. When I would, I don't know when it happened, but when I started thinking about this, And actually, there was a a book, and if you're a reader, read this book. The book is called The Gift of Pain, and it was written by a doctor, Dr. Paul Brand. He was a British doctor who ministered after World War II in India, and he is accredited with discovering the um, the actual, uh, I don't even know what you would call this, cause or what leprosy actually is. You guys familiar with the word leprosy, right? It's actually used in the Bible often, and it's kind of a, 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 a picture of sin. But a long time ago, or before Dr. Paul was around, they thought that leprosy was like a flesh-eating disorder or disease. What he discovered was that leprosy is actually a disease that kills your nerves so that you can't feel. You can't feel pain. And what happens is, is that you injure yourself, you hurt yourself, maybe you get like a cut or your, your foot will get like dislocated and it'll cause injury and then that leads to infection and gangrene and it starts to what? Kill your, your body, your flesh. So what is the danger? That you can't feel pain. You guys get it? Pain and suffering in our midst is actually a gift. That might be a hard thing. 
If you disagree with me, read the book and you can get mad at Dr. Paul. Don't get mad at me. But seriously, that's what Jesus says. This man's blindness was, he wanted us to see that we're all blind, that we're all broken, that we're all broken. So, you know, yeah, I guess I want to just encourage you or challenge you as we think about this topic with a few different things, some next steps, some points of application. First thing I want you to think about is how can you boldly respond to pain and suffering that's a part of living in this broken world? How can you respond to that? How should you respond to that? How can you respond as God wants you to respond? Have you taken the time? Are you willing to put in the work to empathize with people around you. That's my first next step. The next next step is if, if you're suffering, if you're like the man who was born blind, don't allow the pain and the suffering to lead you into hopelessness and bitterness but allow those, that brokenness, that pain, the suffering, allow it to point you to Jesus, all right? Allow it to, to teach you that we live in a, a broken world and that God will heal one day. He will. It's coming. It's going to happen. And then I want to encourage us as a community of believers to embrace the pain and the suffering, those with disabilities, special needs, because it allows us to show the world something about God that they won't find anywhere else. Let's be that kind of community. Let's be those kinds of Jesus followers. This world is broken, man. And I think there's a lot of suffering and pain that goes on behind closed doors in our communities, actually. Let's respond to that as God does. Let's not, you know, isolate or be indifferent or not care. Let's enter into that. And it's real, trust me. We know. I know. You know, our son has been an incredible gift to us. He's enriched our lives, but man, it's tough sometimes. The seizures that he has, you know, the falling, and he, he's broken bones because of that, and you know, his epilepsy causes these kind of like bipolar swings and like mania that like we can't even recognize him sometimes. It's real, I know. I'm not trying to like sugarcoat the suffering and the pain. But God is in the midst of it. And it's through the community of Jesus followers. So I, I hope that you can grab onto that. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful that you know that you came. Jesus, actually, you probably suffered the greatest pain. I don't know that any human can suffer. And you did that to, to show us yourself, to show us God. So we're thankful for that. I want to pray for anybody who is in the situation of suffering pain or, or sickness or disability of any kind, special need, I pray that they would know that you're near, that you're in that with them, and that we are too, that we're a community of Jesus followers that embraces that brokenness. And we want to walk through it together. So we pray in Jesus' name. You know, as I was talking about the brokenness in the world that leads into a really, I would say, kind of the most important recognition that we can make, right? Remember I was saying that Jesus used the, the man born blind, his blindness to show us all that we're blind? Well, there has to be a point in your life where you recognize that you're blind. There has to be that point. There has to be a point where, where you recognize that you are completely 
affected by the brokenness in the world, by the sin that has come into this world. And that can be, you know, the sin that has been passed down, the sin that is in, the, in you know, society all around us, but it's also the sin that's in your heart and it's in my heart, to be honest, you know. You know, sin, what's sin? It, sin, it just, it's not hitting the mark. It's not measuring up to, to, this, to the standard that God wants. You know, the Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. And, you know, the sin that often we think about is the bad things, right? Which we've all done, right? We've all done bad things. But the sin also that we have done, that you and I have done, it's the, the good things that God wants us to do that we don't do, right? It's not loving our enemy, it's not uh, caring for the suffering in the world the way that God wants. That's also sin. Man, when you put like the bad things and then that on top of it, I'm like, I'm just covered in sin. But, you know, that's why Jesus came into the world, right? That's why he was born in pain, in suffering. That's why he lived over 30 years. That's why he died and rose again so that we could be freed from that, so that we could be forgiven of the wrong things that we've done and forgiven of the, the things that we should do that we don't, right? And uh, I think that's really kind of the, the main point of Jesus when you want to like sum it up that way. But like I said, you have to at some point recognize that you're blind and that you're broken and that you need Jesus to forgive you of all of that, all of the sin and, and all of the wrong and all that's messed up about you. And we want to give you that opportunity tonight. It's going to be the most important, you know, recognition or declaration that you'll ever make is that I'm blind, that I need Jesus to forgive me and that I want to begin a new life with Jesus. And so we want to take that time tonight. You know, Jesus died so that he could give forgiveness to anyone, anyone who asks. You know, we read that if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Because it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God, and it's by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. That's it right there. It's not super complicated. <laughs> I think the hardest part a lot of times is just saying, yeah, God, I need you to forgive me. I'm wrong. I'm blind. I need you, Jesus. That's probably the hardest part. But if you're willing to do that, and if you believe that Jesus is the one who died for you so that you could be forgiven, that you could be made right, you could have you know, this brokenness that's in all of us made right, he can do that. So I'm just going to give you that opportunity. Everybody, you know, you can close your eyes. You can bow your head, respect the people around you. And I want to just share a couple things. And then I'm going to give you the opportunity to just raise your hand and, and say, I want to believe in Jesus. I want him to, to forgive me of my sin I want him to heal the brokenness in my life. So God loves you. He sent Jesus into this world to prove that love to you. Actually, you're here you know, tonight or you're listening online, this message, because God loves you. And he wants you to know that he, he wants to forgive you and he wants to heal your brokenness. All you have to do is, is believe in Jesus. So if you're here and you would like to do that, if you're online, I want you to just raise your hand right now. And you can look up at me. And we have people here that want to connect with you. They want to share more about what it means to, to believe in Jesus, to follow him. If you're listening online and you... You want to respond to Jesus? You want, to, you want Jesus to come and forgive you of your sin and heal the brokenness in your life? 
I want you to text the words respond now to 94,000 to the number 94,000 and someone will get in touch with you to help you understand what that means and to understand what it means to believe in Jesus and to walk with him. So let's go ahead and pray and we'll continue with our experience. Lord, we're thankful that you are with us. You are near. Lord, you know those who, who need to hear the message, Lord, of, of you um, being present in the brokenness that all of us are in and the suffering and the pain. You are present. You're here. And there's hope with you. So, Lord, just speak that message of hope to those listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that this message has encouraged you and challenged you to grow in your walk with God. And if you want to stay up to date on new messages every week, be sure to subscribe to our channel to be notified anytime we put up a new video. Here at Riverbank, we're on a rescue mission to reach people with a message of Jesus. And if you would like to partner with us, you can go to riverbankchurch.com slash give or click the giving link in the description. We love you and we are praying for you. We will see you next week.